right. Um, let's make sure I'm on. So Galatians chapter 6 and verses 1 through 10. I have a question that I would like to ask you as we get started. And this is not just a summary question. Um, you know, f this is our last class, and so this would be a really good time, I think, to say, okay, let's summarize Galatians since we've been studying it for three months. That's not what this is. I'm asking you the question because I have something specific in mind that I would like to accomplish with your answers. So I'm not, you don't have, there's no wrong answers here. I don't, don't think about it like that, but I would like you to answer uh, because it will help us out immensely, I think, to, to move into this next section. So the question, um, what is your overall impression of Galatians? And you might answer it like this. The question might be something like, what is Paul's message to the Galatians? He wrote a letter and he said something to them. What did he say? And you can, you don't have to do it in one sentence, but what is it? What is his message uh, in six chapters? And even more than that, up through chapter five, which is where we've been, not only what is his message, but what is your impression of it? Um, Imagine that you are Paul communicating this message to a group of people that you love. What's your demeanor? How are you speaking about this situation? And so what's your overall impression about this whole thing? What do you think? What's the message? What's your impression of the letter? Yeah, Jim? Don't go back. Okay, that's a lot like Hebrews, isn't it? That, I mean, when you say that, that's what I think of. Don't. Go back to the law of Moses. Yeah. Um, I might think about that one just a little bit. You've got Jewish Christians who are telling Gentile Christians who have never been Jews that they need to do the law of Moses in order to be right with God. And so... To the Jewish Christians, don't go back to that. But also, don't tell other people that they have to do that. We're not going backwards, we're going forwards. And so, yeah. What do you think? The message, in a nutshell, your impression of the message, Ryan? I think justification for Jesus is a, a really strong argument. Obviously, it starts off with um, kind of a rebuking of the law being taught. But then it continues into... In the, the conversation between bond versus free, or free with the story of Abraham and all of that to relay a story about freedom that's through the justification that Jesus offers and nothing else. Yeah, yeah. And so justification, to be made right with God through Christ, not the law of Moses. Did you have something, Kevin? Yeah, maybe a little bit along the same lines. I was thinking... I was thinking that Paul is talking about Judaizing teachers. And so that's me putting myself in their, you know, trying to read it from their perspective. But Judaizing teachers wasn't really a major issue for anyone, you know, at least that I know. Um, so what I see more from Galatians is that there's a, a guy there kind of touched on it. One of how, from Paul's perspective, we're seeing an expert at how do you deal with false teaching and how do you address it in an appropriate manner. And then from the flip side, we also see the answer to false teaching and how to identify it and kind of what Brian just said. And Paul throughout the letter gives us gives us points that if, to try to align the teaching that we're hearing with what Jesus actually did and actually said. And we keep seeing, like, does it line up? <coughs> and we're going to, you know, in Galatians 6, 1 through 10, he talks about how you identify false teaching because you see. Yeah, that's, and that's really where I'm headed with this conversation. You said a couple of things, and I'll just repeat them because I don't want to forget it. I will, but I don't want to forget it. You mentioned the Judaizing teachers, and you mentioned the false teachers. 
And so you have Galatians that starts with, if I or even an angel for, from heaven teaches you something different from the gospel that we've taught to you already, then you're going to be cursed. That's not okay. And so there is something going on in Galatia that is a person, a group of people, Judaizing teachers is a group of people, maybe a person. It kind of sounds like to me, when I read Galatians a couple times through, it kind of sounds to me like there's maybe a guy, maybe like one main problem, but I can't pinpoint that. It's just my impression. There's somebody in these churches creating trouble, telling these new Gentile Christians that they have to do the law of Moses to be right with God. And Paul says, no, you're right with God through Jesus. And that's it. That's been the case for all of us. I'm going to throw up my chart here. This is my summary of Galatians up to this point. And uh, you can make your, your thoughts about this. But here are some of the high points, I think. Um, Paul starts off the whole first two chapters. My message is from God, not from man. And so here's what God has to say. The key issue is what he said to Peter. If you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you force the Gentiles to live like Jews? I don't know how you would mark something like this in your Bible. In my Bible, that's what orange is for. But orange is to say, here is a, if I'm looking at Galatians, I want to see this verse because this is the key issue in this book. This is the problem that's being addressed. And so, Ryan, here's your point. You hit the nail on the head. This is the affirmative statement of Galatians 2.16. We know that a person is not made right with God by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. And so, basically, Galatians is three really fast arguments and one really big argument. This Jewish Christians, you people that are creating this problem, you're Christians. You came to God through Christ. It wasn't the law that got it done for you. You came through Christ. And so you know that Jesus is a big deal. I, Paul, came to God through Christ. And so Christ is a big deal, not the law. And the implication is with Paul, I mean, I kind of was a big deal with the law. So if the law wasn't getting it done for me, then... You know, it's not going to get it done for people. I had to come through Christ. He said to the Galatians, you Galatians, this is how you came to be right with God through Christ, not the law. The implication is why would you go back? There you go, Jim. Why would you go back? And, and then most of, I don't know, maybe at least half or two thirds of Galatians has to do with Abraham. Some kind of thing to do with Abraham. Um, the promise that God made was to Abraham, not the law of Moses. Abraham was before that. And you've got Sarah and Hagar and uh, all of these different things. And so here is Paul dealing with a tense situation with a troublemaker or a group of troublemakers. And he is essentially trying to rescue a group of baby Christians from falling off a cliff after, after they've just come to know the Lord for the very first time. Um, this is a pretty personal situation. I, I, I lead us up into this to, to talk about. This is, this is one of those things where I would think, I would think, I mean, this is serious. That's the point. This is serious, what he's been talking about. Which, now that we get to Galatians chapter 6 and verse 1, this, these 10 chapters just knock me to the floor because this is not what I would expect Paul to say at this point. I mean, I'm not trying to be crude or funny. He just said a couple verse, verses ago in chapter 5, if you want to talk about circumcising people, I wish you would just emascul emasculate yourself. Like, put the picture in your head. Paul's not messing around with what he says to this group of people. And then we come to chapter 6 and verse 1. And the question that I have now is, who is he talking to at this point? Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual 
should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Who is Paul talking to here? And who is he talking about? Yeah. So who is he? Who? So yeah, so yeah. So who does Paul address this to? Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, is that your answer? You think if anyone is caught in any transgression, that's these Jewish teachers? I mean, does that? <laughs> does that just? I don't know. I mean, I know this is Christianity. I know that this is what Christianity is supposed to be like, but. Doesn't that just kind of punch you right in the gut to think? Paul has spent five chapters talking about these troublemakers and you can't do this and let him be accursed if you're going to say the things that you've been saying. He's been really, that was the second part of my question. What's your impression of the letter up to this point? Like this has been a hard letter. When people talk about Galatians and Romans, Galatians and Romans are a lot alike. They have a lot of the same message. But when commentators talk about Galatians and Romans, what they do is they say, Galatians is shorter because, or Romans is longer because it happens later and Paul's had more time to think it through and work it out. And so he's got a fuller argument when he writes Romans. But when they, when they compare the two, they say, boy, Paul was really just mad and terse in Galatians. And he just said it. And he doesn't do that quite the same way in Romans. And so which my impression of Galatians is this is one of the hardest hitting books in the New Testament. And now, and now all of a sudden, Paul is saying to the church who has been influenced by these people, it's like he turns his attention. You false teachers, no, you can't do this. And then he turns to the church and he says, brothers, listen, if anyone the false teachers is caught in any transgression out there. You who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. I mean, what does that sound like to you? Whenever I, I, I've read that verse a million times and read it in sermons, but I don't think ever in this context where it's like, wow, at this point in this letter to say that sentence, it's, it's as if he says, even those troublemakers are worth going after. Um, and here's something else that I thought was really interesting. Um, even if anyone is caught in any transgression, I don't know how I came upon the definitions of the word caught. Maybe this commentary is what started it for me. But what the word caught, if anyone is caught in any transgression, overtaken in any transgression, it can mean either to be caught doing something wrong or trapped, or in a more vivid sense, um, sh if a person should do something wrong on a sudden impulse. And then here's low nida. This is what this is a lexicon definition of the word caught here. To learn something by surprise, to detect, to surprise, to catch, to be discovered. If someone is caught in any kind of wrongdoing, and so here we're going to talk about our verse right now. It is possible that this word refers to actual seizing or arresting. If anyone is caught in transgression, I caught you. But, but then they go on and they say, there's something more likely than that. It seems more likely to refer to the fact that someone becomes aware of wrongdoing. And therefore, the wrongdoer is surprised by being detected or discovered. Um, what's your impression of that? Here's the Judaizing teacher that Paul's been criticizing this whole time. And he describes that person as somebody who's been caught in transgression. What do you think about that? What kind of impression does that leave in your head? Like, what does that look like? Yeah, Mark? Possibly part of it, maybe it was not completely intentional. Um, you know, I think there's probably some intent on 
on some of the stuff this guy or this group was teaching, but it just got away from them and it took on more than it did. And now they're caught in here. They're, they're like, oh. And, but then he follows it up just a little bit later and say, anybody who thinks himself more than a mason theft, what does it say? Let me go to it. It says, if for anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. That makes it look at me. We're looking at him, the bad guy, but, but it could be me, too. Yeah. I've, I think exactly the first thing that you said, too. Like, I mean, it, it starts off intentional. He has good motives. He's trying to serve God. The thing has just got away from him, and he's got caught up in the whole situation. And I, I, th this has happened to me before. I think about these things, and it's like I get carried away with the stream, and I'm... Halfway down the river before I even realize what's going on. Do you think that Paul reminds us a little bit about his road to Damascus? <laughs> yeah. Paul's like, hey, remember that time I was holding Stephen's coat? I know what it looks like to get caught up in, in this thing and to go farther than I intend. I think it sounds like Paul is almost preparing for what happens in this congregation after the new comes. I think it's really likely that we can imagine some of the Christians who were against the Judaizing teachers to run with this letter in hand and say, look what Paul said. We have words from the apostle. You're wrong. Uh, we're not following the law. But he's saying, well, no, when you, when you get this letter, when I tell you the truth, this is how you're supposed to treat them. Not to say I gotcha, not to say here's the letter from the apostle, but can we restore ourselves as a congregation back to truth? Jonathan, I see you here. Let me read something real quick before I come to your comment. Look over at 2 Corinthians chapter 2. Ryan, your comment. 2 Corinthians 2, let's see, verses 5 through 11. If anyone has caused pain, he has caused it not to me, but in some measure need to be put too severely uh, to all of you, for such a one, this punishment by the majority is enough so that you should rather turn and forgive and comfort him, or he may be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. So I beg you to reaffirm your love for him, for this is why I wrote that I might test you to know whether you are obedient in everything. Anyone whom you forgive, I also forgive indeed. What I have forgiven, if I have forgiven anything, has been for your sake in the presence of Christ, so that we would not be outwitted by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his designs. So yeah, he's going to send this letter. Hopefully the Galatians are going to respond and say, you're not saying something that's right. But that does not mean you get the tar and you get the feathers. We're going to have a lynching. That's not how we respond in a situation. And so you see, you see this, if anyone's caught up in this, this is what we're supposed to do about it. Restore them. We'll talk about restore in just a second. Yeah, that's good. Steve's always got good thoughts on that stuff. Um, so look at this one, to restore. this. One. You who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. I just read that and I'm like, you weren't very gentle in your letter, Paul. But this is what he's telling us to do. And the word restore. Restore to its former condition. To make it complete. The first of these meanings is highly suitable to describe the restoration of a Christian who has lapsed, whether by Judaizing or in any other way. And this, the same word restore is the word that's used in the gospel when they describe mending nets. So if anyone among you has been caught up in this thing, here is your job as the church in Galatia. Start mending some nets to put the stuff back together again.
had to change their life. They may have had to go through the circumcision. And then Paul basically says why the Judaizers did this in 12. Uh, they, they wanted to make a good showing in the flesh so they could compel you to be circumcised so that they wouldn't suffer the persecution of the cross. Um, then in 13, they wanted to boast in their flesh. Um, so it's just like, he, he, he kind of said, all right, forgive them gently. This is why they did that. They were weak. They were, uh, they were vain. Yeah. They were yeah. Vain. I don't know if that, I mean, the conversation is one that I've spent a couple of days just rolling around in my head like, wow, I can't, I know this is Christianity, but I just can't hardly wrap my head around it. <laughs> yeah, so Sarah and then Adam. Yeah. It just seems like he's just saying in general, and, and then even to maybe it seemed like the for me the Galatians were like most dazzled by these teachers and thinking, oh, I need and not holding firm in what Paul had taught them, and some of these things such as how to work with each other and carry each other's burdens and you know continuing to. Rely on what Jesus did to save you, and like those things are what's going to help you just continue on um, the path that you taught them. Yeah. But, you know, that's yeah. No, that's fine. That's fine. I would, you know, you talk about the works of the flesh, the fruit of the spirit. I'll skip the first couple works of the flesh, but. The enmity, the strife, the jealousy, the fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy. Those things fit the same group of people that he's been talking about all up to this point. Don't do that. And he says, this is what the Spirit does. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Do that instead. And just ignore the chapter break. Pretend like the chapter break's not there. Brothers, if any one of you has caught out any transgression, so... Yeah, I mean, it could be general, but it seems more to me like I've been talking about this group of people the whole time. So, But I see what you're saying. Like, in general, this is how to behave. Adam, go ahead. Uh, I was just going to ask, like, what do you think we can learn from the overall way that Paul went about this? Because he didn't go with gentleness right away, if this is to the false teachers, and just say they're there. But he also didn't just steamroll them and leave them for dead and end the book, you know? So just uh, trying to think, like, if it's a tough on the false doctrine, but still keeping our arms open to people, or, like, kind of what we would say is the, the example that's being shown. So that's a good question. There's a couple things that, that come just right into my mind, and anybody else can answer on this one. The first one, the first one is um, speak truth in love. We have to say what's true. 
and we can't just let people do crazy things, this stuff that he's talking about in this letter, but there's a right way to do it. And then I'm thinking of the thing that, that Paul told Titus about this, about how the gospel, um, the truth from above is first pure, but then gentle, peaceable, and all of these other things. And so maybe this is our main takeaway. We have to say what's true, but if you say what's true in a wrong way, you can be wrong yourself. You have to say what's true, but you have to do it right. And our job ultimately is to restore, not to burn down. How about that? The job is to, the, the goal is to restore, not to burn down. What do you think? Yeah, yeah. No, I'm with you. That's, I mean, this passage has been tough for me to process for what you're saying here too. So let's do this because I want to I wanna make sure that we at least get to the point because someone said this. This is the thing that I say to my kids all the time and that sometimes Becky says to me um, and I repeat often, each one of us can only control ourselves. If it was any other way, I would ask Mike to go with me and grab people on the street and forcibly baptize them. But that's not how it works. Um, we can only control ourselves. I can't control other people. And so just reading through here, I'm going to start in verse 4. And listen to what Paul is saying here in talking to this group of people. We've been pointing out the transgressors, whatever the transgression is, Judaizers or otherwise. We can't, we can't do that. It's not something that's going to be allowed. We want to restore them. But here's the end of the road, verse 4, in the way that we do it. Let each one test his own work, and then his reasons to boast will be in himself alone and not in his neighbor. I hate to do this, but here is a, a translation a version of that from God's Word, the Bible called God's Word. Each of you must examine your own actions. Then you can be proud of your own accomplishments without comparing yourself to others. Um, verse 5. For each will have to bear his own load. Let the one who is taught the word share all good things with the one who teaches. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that will he also reap. And so that goes... For that guy who's been saying stuff that's not true, but it also goes for this guy who's responding to that stuff that that guy said. Whatever one sows, that will he also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption, and the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. Let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. In this context, here's the deal. I don't want to deal with that guy any longer than I have to. Because he's created a giant headache for me. And as soon as we can just be done with it, great. But Paul's point here is, this is when you lose, when you give up. That's when, that's when it's over. Let us not grow weary of doing good. For in due season we will reap if we do not give up. So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone and especially to those who are of the household of faith. And I think the overriding message in this main section is we've spent all of our time talking about that guy and what he can't do. Now Paul turns the finger and he says, but you can only control yourself and this is how you act when you got to do something about this. That's hard. Thoughts on that one? Kevin and then Ryan. Um, I was thinking somewhere about Paul's 
harshness earlier in the, the contract thing with what the Magento has. Um, I was thinking on the, it's kind of a two-stage process is what it looks like is occurring here because the restoration hasn't occurred yet. So what Paul has done up to this point is not part of, it's not the restoration. It's kind of like, it's the rebuke. It's calling the attention, you know, calling them to attention that this is what's being done. And that's going to your point about speaking the truth. So Paul is speaking the truth and he's not mincing his words and expressing what's going on and what's wrong with it. But once that's been pointed out, there's a hard stop, but then you change to, if they're going to be restored, then you do it in this manner. Um, and I was thinking you were talking about um, where you said the thing was caught in transgression, and the different definitions you were reading reminded me a lot of um, Leviticus 1 through 6, with the different, and it's God telling the Israelites the different sacrifices, and for several of the sacrifices that are for sin, it talks about people who have sinned unintentionally, um, but then they realize their guilt. They still have to offer a sacrifice. That's that steep price that they have to pay. And the sacrifices that were part of them were valuable. Um, in some cases, they had to offer a sacrifice, and then some. And I, in some ways, that's, hard, that's harsh, too. Yeah. But then it says, and they shall be forgiven. And it's, it's gone. Yeah. Whatever you had done before, it's no more. Yeah. And so what I've seen is that God's still the same God. And there's a, it hurts. There's a price that is paid in the rebuke. But like God, we need to restore in that gentleness. Yeah. I heard too. Whenever you started off, I, I thought of Adam's question. The letter up to this point is the rebuke. This is our responsibility in the midst of the rebuke, but maybe it's like the Corinthian situation. Okay, but when that guy decides he would like to rejoin the family, don't just keep it going. So, Ryan? I just appreciate that um, Paul is again anticipating um, what's going to happen in the future of this congregation, knowing that the issue of Judaizing teachers is not going to be the only thing that will come up in the history of this church. And so I like that in, in verse 8, for the one who sows in his own flesh, you know, forcing the law on people is not going to be the only way that we sow in the flesh. So if there is really any section of this book that kind of calls out to us as a modern reader, I think it's going to be this section that says, yeah, sure, we might not have problems or debates over the law. Um, but there are going to be other issues of sowing in the flesh in the congregation. Mm -hmm. And regardless, um, whether we're here in this congregation now um, or in Galatia with that issue, the standard is still the same to mirror the way Christ would deal with the situation. Yeah. yeah, I think of Sarah's comment there too. Maybe Paul was addressing this specific situation, but... Even if it's bigger than that, we can certainly take the principle and apply it in all different ways. I see Luke here and then Jim. Yeah, so I say like he, he put the brakes on the false teaching, but then he didn't just stop there. He said, okay, and then he gave them a direction. He said, you do this, you do that. Um, and he also, I think he was kind of like avoiding a Judas situation, Judas Iscariot. Yeah, there's a, there's a pathway back. There's a pathway home. And our job is to facilitate the pathway. You can't be here if you're going to say things that aren't true. But if you decide you would like to be here, it's our job to facilitate that. I'm still on thinking about your question of the practical. Who was it, Jim? It's, it's, it's like being a mother and father. Yeah. It's the same principle in the church. Yeah. Yeah. And the older brother who stands over here like this saying, You never sacrificed a cow for me. You say, Hey, 
You've always been here. Let's welcome the lost son home. That's the point. That's, a, that's, that's been a lot of the... I appreciate your comments because it's, it helps me to kind of work through a lot of the... Um, this is one of those things. I mean, once I, I think I started to wrap my head around the context and what Paul was saying to the Galatians, that's when you start to get into, okay, it's not really all that hard to understand, but it sure is hard to do. And so here's how the letter ends. Not a whole lot probably worth talking about. It's just that, no, it, there's worth talking about, but we don't have time. But this is, this is it. This is how he finishes with the conclusion. The, this is like a personal signature. See with what large letters I'm writing to you with my own hand. It is those who want to make a good showing in the flesh who would force you to be circumcised and only in order that they may not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. For even if those who are circumcised do not themselves keep the law, but they desire to have you circumcised that they may boast in your flesh... But far be it from me to boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. For neither circumcision counts for anything, excuse me, nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. And as for all who walk by this rule, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. From now on, let no one cause me trouble, for I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit, brothers. Amen. That's that. All right. Um, on Sunday, Adam is going to start teaching Nehemiah. I don't know where he wants to start, but a really good thing to do before you study a book is just read Nehemiah. In order to prepare for class and what Adam's going to be doing for the next three months, uh, you got a couple days. If you, it's better to read it in one setting, but you got a couple days if you need to break it up. Make sure to read Nehemiah. Thank you.